Hello, I'm Diana Thomas. And I'm Tom Harper. Welcome to That Will the Smith Show. A podcast about the historical, geographical, natural and human background to the world of Will the Smith. other news that at the time seemed insignificant, but which was to change the destiny of this very Egypt and of all of us who lived along the river. It seemed that a new and warlike tribe had come out of an unknown land to the east of Syria, carrying all before them. Nobody knew much about these warlike people, except that they seemed to have developed a form of warfare that had never been seen before. They could cross vast distances very swiftly, and no army could stand against them. There were always wild rumours of new enemies about to assail this very Egypt. I'd heard 50 like this one before, and thought as little of this one as I had of all the others. It seemed that they called themselves the Shepherd Kings, the Hyksos. The name would not have slid over my tongue so smoothly if I understood then what it would mean to our world. So that was a fateful passage from Wilbur Smith's novel, River God, uh, which we are continuing to look at in this episode. And we are really lucky to be joined to set us straight on some of the historical detail uh, by a special guest, Professor Joanne Fletcher. Uh, Now, Joanne is Honorary Visiting Professor in the Department of Archaeology at the University of York and Lead Ambassador for the Egypt Exploration Society. She's also co-founder of York University's Mummy Research Group, has studied human remains from around the world, including the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, and she works with museums in the UK and abroad. Uh, She's written a number of books, including Cleopatra the Great, The Search for Nefertiti, and The Story of Egypt. And her numerous appearances on TV include the BAFTA-winning Mummifying Alan, Egypt's Last Secret, and BBC Two's four-part series Immortal Egypt with Joanne Fletcher. Joanne, we're so thrilled to have you with us today. So thank you very much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's uh, wonderful to have you here. And uh, not only are you going to enlighten us on the history behind River God, uh, but Diana has actually spotted that you yourself have a link with Wilbur Smith's work. Yes, indeed. Um, River God, which is set in ancient Egypt, has a sequel, which is set in the present day and involves Egyptologists searching for treasure that is left behind. Um, in River God. Um, so it's like 3,000 years later, um, the archaeologists setting out. And the heroine of the Seventh Scroll, who is called Royanne, is, um, is, is kind of linked to, and I think is even a guest lecturer at, the School of Egyptology at York University. So Joanne meet Royanne, Royanne meet Joanne, two York-based Egyptologists... <laughs> I could just feel it, you know, I had a, a feeling about it. That is incredible because I'm not a reader of fiction at all beyond vampire fiction. So, you know, this is, you know, all, all things coming together. So very, very excited to be here. I have to say that Ryan is not a vampire. <laughs> we'll find a way forward nonetheless. <laughs> So, yeah, so uh, not being a, a reader of fiction, uh, you've not read uh, River God, um, so you uh, can uh, set us straight on, uh, on some of the historical background to it. So, and we can maybe fill you in a bit on the novel. So it starts, uh, I actually, I've read your book, um, the, the Story of Egypt. And from that, I worked out that I think we're in the second intermediate period between the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom. So can you tell us a bit about what the situation in Egypt is at that point in time, and in fact, when that point in time is? Yeah, I mean, you've got the glorious Middle Kingdom, which was like a cultural renaissance within Egypt, when everything was right with the world, the pharaohs were all powerful, Egypt was really a a zenith, uh, one of the several zeniths it reached culturally, politically, in military terms for sure. Um, But then uh, towards around probably 1750, 1700 BC, there started to be quite a rapid turnover of of monarchs. 
and when a pharaoh's on the throne for maybe two or three years at best, it sort of increases the sort of political instability. The borders aren't as well controlled as they might be. The defences around Egypt aren't as strong as they once were. And we do know around this time, uh, and, and for quite a number of centuries before this, um, settlers were coming into Egypt to enjoy the good life, as, as, as they rightly saw it. Uh, including those from all around the eastern Mediterranean seaboard, from the Levant and so forth. They were coming into Egypt to trade, to settle, bringing their families, integrating into Egyptian society. But of course, integration into this very tolerant Egyptian society saw them sort of um, advance through the ranks on merit and become quite powerful. So by around 1650 BC, you had these individuals within Egyptian society, and yet, in many ways, uh, culturally different, different names, different customs and so forth, congregating in the northeastern part of Egypt uh, to the point where they were poised to sort of take the top jobs, as it were. But was there, in fact, a military invasion as well? No. No, it used to be that Egyptologists thought that... Uh, there was this this great invasion uh, from the Middle East, you know, hordes sweeping in in their newfangled chariots, using horses and bringing in all the military hardware that Egypt simply didn't have at that time. But because of ongoing excavations on Egypt's northeastern border, in and around the northern delta, it now seems very different. This is a peaceful infiltration, but a kind of takeover from within. Right. That seems to be what's happening. Um, and as this sort of power group uh, seized the throne around 1650 BC, they held on to Egypt for a full century and controlled Egypt from their, their, their city in the, the, the northeastern delta area, a city called Avaris. And the whole name, Hyksos, is really a corruption of the Egyptian name for these people of fundamentally uh, foreign origins. The Egyptians called them simply are the, the rulers of foreign lands, the Heka Hasut. And over time that became, uh, you know, when the Greeks took over Egypt, looking back at Egypt's history, they pronounced Heka Hasut as Hyksos with the Greek ending. So we now know them as the Hyksos. But so, for example, just take the chariots. So e Egyptians... Soldiers did not have chariots until the Hyksos. Yeah, exactly. So it's not so much that they're conquered by the technology, but as it were, the technology is absorbed into... The technology was, yeah, was, was brought in uh, all in uh, around the, the, the northeastern border of Egypt by these powerful individuals who took the throne. And Egyptians to the south simply didn't have this technology so you've got the uh, the egyptian resistance if you like the uh, traditional egyptian power bases further south strung out down the nile valley at places like abydos and certainly thebes modern luxor the, the thebans as i said modern luxor the people there were the sort of uh, the, the the heart of of traditional egyptian monarchy, tradi traditional Egyptian customs. Uh, that was the sort of outpost, if you like. And they really resented being controlled politically and militarily by these guys based up at Tavaris in the northeast. Right. But in terms of a physical uh, sort of conflict, this wasn't really possible because the Thebans were still using the simple bow. They didn't have access to the chariots and the horses that these Hyksos had, had, had brought in with them and sort of uh, used in and around the northeast of Egypt. And it was only by gradually studying and learning and absorbing this technology for themselves could the Thebans even think of mounting any kind of war of uh, independence, sort of the, the, the great fight back. So it was a question of working out how these, these bows worked, these, these composite bows, which could... Uh, shoot arrows at far greater distances but also to acquire horses for themselves and also to work out how to build chariots for themselves 
um, because you can't take on an enemy that is so superior in every way militarily to yourselves. You you have to absorb and learn uh, from from their military hardware, and that's exactly what the Thebans and their uh, Egyptian allies throughout the rest of Egypt managed to do. So by around uh, 1600, certainly by 1550 BC, they were in a, a very, very strong position. And we do see the sort of uh, rebellion of the native Egyptians, the thick led by Thebes, starting to take on the, the Hyksos in the northeast. I mean, that's very much the theme of of both River God and the sequel books is, is, is about that. In fact, River God, as it were, fictionalizes but shows the, the way in which Egyptians, through the central character guy called Taita, who's a sort of genius eunuch slave, and he figures out how to make a better chariot with better wheels and give them the, the means to come back. But so, did the Hicks, that one of the things that's confusing, I think, to, to kind of casual listeners may have been we were talking in, in our previous episode about upper egypt and lower egypt which is confusing because if you look on a map and you're just looking the bit that's upper egypt is actually below the bit that's lower egypt because of course you're referring to the upper nile and the lower nile so well, it's, it's because the, the nile flows south to north so in the egyptian world that made perfect sense yeah 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 I so said, well, actually, were those terms they used? Was it upper and lower a term or their equivalent thereof? Would that have been terms they actually used? Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, ancient Egypt has always been that classic land of two halves. Right. It's, uh, I mean, not to want, not to draw too many parallels to today's so-called levelling up, where we live in a Britain of uh, two halves, <laughs> north and south, but uh, we do, and so did the ancient Egyptians. And that the south was a, a very different part of Egypt to the north, um, going right back to the beginning of Egyptian history. Upper Egypt, southern Egypt, the, the majority of the Nile Valley is very, very close culturally, um, politically, ethnically to Africa. I mean, Egypt is in Africa, obviously, but in many ways that the south of Egypt, upper Egypt, you can see a real continuum of, of culture from the very beginning of, you know, go back to 4000 BC. You've got so many uh, continuities and similarities in, in grave goods, for instance, that the whole of uh, southern Egypt into what is now Sudan, ancient Nubia. There's no magic cutoff, yeah. no magic border. It's simply a continuum. And that's a very rich history. However, in the north, you very much have in what, what the Egyptians call Lower Egypt, uh, Northern Egypt. You very much have culturally, politically, etc., very strong links to the Levant because from time immemorial, people from the Eastern Mediterranean, of, uh, of, of, uh, yeah, the Eastern Mediterranean area had been coming in and out of Egypt, travelling freely to trade, to settle. So the Delta, for instance, culturally is very close in terms of its... Um, it's it's religion, it's stories, the way they did things. Um, they were sort of uh, linked very closely to that part of the ancient world. So Egypt has always been a land of two halves, no question about it. So any current debate about was Egypt, you know, African, was it part of the Middle East? Well, it was both. It is now, it was then, and it always will be. And I think... You, you get a certain amount of polarisation, but that's natural because that's just the way the location of Egypt then and now geographically has functioned. And uh, and that's certainly true in Hyksos times. That's why the Hyksos could so comfortably settle in the Delta, rule northern Egypt, lower Egypt quite easily, whereas the south, upper Egypt, culturally very different, politically very different. So... It's strange in, in, in times of stress politically within Egypt, the so-called intermediate periods when there was not one very strong single monarch, Egypt would always break into these its default position of upper and lower Egypt. And it's whoever could combine these two halves, bring the two halves together successfully and rule over them as a single entity. That was the mark of a strong ruler. Right. So that's always got to be kept in the background. It is a land of two halves. 
Cool. And in fact, when the novel opens, when River God opens, uh, it is, as we say, it's in this intermediate period. Um, obviously, they didn't know it's intermediate at the time, um, but it's divided in two halves. Uh, and our, our hero, Taita, and, and his um, his colleagues, they're all in, I'm going to get this right, Upper Egypt, uh, based in Thebes. Uh, and and he talks about um, they're kind of at a sort of war, but it's kind of a desultory war um, with with Lower Egypt. Um, and then and then the the, the Hyksos come in. Uh, now I have to I have to warn you, Joe. You've not read the book, but uh, in Wilbur's work, it's not a gradual uh, kind of immersion absorption sort of process. Uh, in 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 River God, the the Hyksos arrive as this sort of sandstorm whirlwind coming in across the desert as their chariots kicking up all the dust. <laughs> uh, and, 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 the, and the Egyptians are looking at this, thinking, "God, we've never seen anything like this," and they get absolutely blown away. <laughs> Cool. Yes, indeed. Um, so here is Wilbur's vivid description of the dramatic arrival of the Hyksos. I looked once more beyond our ranks at that ominous rolling yellow cloud, and my confidence wavered. This was something beyond military tradition, beyond the experience of any general in all our long, proud history. Were these mortal men that we were facing, or, as rumour suggested, were they fiends? When I stared into the swirling clouds, they were now so close that I could make out dark shapes in the dun and gloomy veils of dust. My skin crawled with a kind of religious horror as I recognised the ship-like shapes that our prisoners had warned us of. But these were smaller and swifter than any vessel that had ever been launched on water, swifter even than any creature that had ever moved upon the surface of the earth. It was difficult to follow one of these shapes with the eye, for they were ethereal and quick as moths in the light of a lantern. They wheeled and wove and disappeared in the moving clouds, so that when they reappeared, it was impossible to tell whether it was the same or another like it. There was no way to count their numbers, or even to guess at what followed the first ranks of their advance. Behind them, the dust cloud extended back to the horizon from which they had come. So uh, clearly, clearly a bit of a case of dramatic license there. I think um, I, I kind of understand where he's coming from, because I... There is peaceful infiltration, but I think we should not underestimate the drama that the Hyksos knew their their chariot, their horse and chariots, uh, you know, sort of turning up uh, en masse. Could, I mean, it might have even been a staged event for all we know at some point of this. They knew they had northern Egypt. They knew they controlled Egypt politically. But to have maybe one of the, the sort of... Uh, a, a part of, of their army or their forces arriving in this way would have been very dramatic, would have made this big statement because the whole point about the chariot, which literally blew the Egyptians' mind, was that instead of having armies, infantry, trudging across the desert or sailing up and down the Nile when everything was almost done slow motion mm. because of, of the, 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 the environment of Egypt, you've got the ability to bring death and destruction so much more quickly. I mean, these ancient chariots could achieve speeds of up to uh, 25 miles an hour, which in our day is, is, is rubbish. <laughs> but in ancient times, like if you've got even a small group of armed men turning up at that speed with the firepower they had with these scimitars, which the Egyptians didn't have, the Kapesh scimitars, with the composite bows the Egyptians didn't have, able to you know shoot arrows huge distances this would have been terrifying you would have only needed a small number of people to do that so it would have had the 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 visual effect uh, of sort of keeping the egyptians in their place but also uh, obviously if the hyksos had already infiltrated northeastern egypt they could be sure of a a good welcome and and we know that for for many decades the hyksos were you know living very comfortably alongside the Egyptians they controlled in the north of Egypt. There are so many texts saying you know we are content. These are the Egyptians saying we are content with our with our part. You know we have the the Hyksos king in Avaris. We have our lands in the Delta. We're happy. They didn't necessarily want to unite with their Egyptian countrymen in Luxor, ancient Thebes. It's like leave us alone. We're okay. We like the status quo. And it's the Thebans who are pushing their own Egyptian compatriots to say, no, no, we've got to push them out. And I think that's a very interesting thing. We see it again in later parts of Egyptian history when you'd think 
just because they're all Egyptian in North and South, they would want to come together to get rid of the foreign so-called usurper. But not at all. Quite often, they the Northerners side with the, the so, so-called foreign power that's occupying Egypt, rather than throwing their lot with the, the Southerners uh, based down in, in Thebes, because the Thebans were a bullshit lot. I absolutely love them. I still do. Modern Luxor people are the best. I love them. Um, but it's sort of this idea that, you know, it's it's not a very straightforward story. It's not Egypt versus the Hyksos. It's so nuanced. And I think that's that what that's what makes it such a, a wonderful, powerful time in Egyptian history. You know, it's uh, the subtleties are great. For instance, the Hyksos pharaoh, he called himself a pharaoh. He ruled as a pharaoh. He worshipped the traditional gods of Egypt. Um, one of the Hyksos kings, Apophis, is even proud of the fact he learnt hieroglyphs. He goes on about the fact that he is a true pharaoh. He does things by the ancient Egyptian book. He is no usurper. He is the true pharaoh. So it's very, very clever. He's sort of saying, I'm more Egyptian than you lot. Um, so he's playing both sides. He was a very clever guy. But the Hyksos were brilliant, um, you know, they were only there for a century, but they did make their mark on Egyptian culture. About these Bolshe Thebans, I mean, yeah. is there a kind of contrast between, as I mean, Northerners would regard Southerners like me as being hopelessly soft and wet? And ah, no, 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 let me stop you there. No, <laughs> in Egypt, you know, Upper Egypt is, is the South and Lower Egypt's the North. That's the way we draw the map of Egypt. The Egyptians saw it the other way. So the upper Egyptians, the southerners, are our northerners. So the Thebans are like us folk up here in Yorkshire, (laughs) which you've got to love because the Thebans were always under the cosh, you know, till they had enough and they rebelled. And it was like, look at these soft northerners up there in lower Egypt, in and around the capital, whether it was Avaris under the Hyksos or the traditional capital Memphis. It is exactly, in my mind at least, just like modern Britain today. Uh, But I always sort of remember to think that the way the ancient Egyptians saw it, the way that we view their map is the way we draw it for them. The upper Egyptians were the northerners. Typical northerners come charging in before the southern ladies finished her point. And I was going to say exactly what you just said. (laughs) We have to get in there, mate. We have to get in while we've got a chance. (laughs) You're absolutely right. And so so I think we're both, our point point rests in both cases. Case rest. <laughs> I think we also ought to tell our listeners that uh, both Joe and I are uh, coming here from Yorkshire, uh, whereas Diane is down uh, down south. So we're, we're uh, living the north-south divide on this podcast, but uh, we're, we'll try not to beat Diana up too much. I can see the English Channel from my bathroom window. So there you go. That's how south I am. <laughs> Could not be more south. Yeah. Couldn't be any southern. Um, cool. I think that the, the, I want to come back to the, the the two kingdoms bit because I think again um, Wilbur has possibly um, taken some licenses with history. But before we go there, we, we've talked a couple of times about the chariots and the horses, and Diana and I were talking about this before the show. And first of all, in the book in River God, um, not only have they never seen a chariot before, but they've never seen the wheel before, no. and they've also never seen horses before. Mm. Um, and both Diana and I were saying, you know, this is, as you say, this is a, a trading civilization. They're going all around the Levant. They've got stuff coming in from as far away as Afghanistan, probably in terms of like the lapis lazuli and so on. So how on earth, first of all, is this correct that they've never seen these things? And second of all, if so, how have they never managed to come across these things in all their travels? Well, it's a, a little bit of both, I suppose. Certainly chariots were new to them. The idea of a very lightweight vehicle on two wheels that could zoom about at the the speeds that we're talking about. Um, However, the wheel did exist in ancient Egypt. Some recent research has said as as early as the Pyramid Age, so certainly by 2300 BC they were aware of wheels. Um, We have wheeled vehicles uh, used in Egypt in limited numbers, um, probably by the second intermediate period already, but these were mainly for transport. But as I said, it's a very limited usage because in Egypt, your main superhighway is the River Nile to get from A to B. It's a very linear uh, mm. sort of 
land obviously because transport was mainly up and down the river by boat because at either side of this you've got a largely a desert landscape you've got the muddy banks of the Nile then you've got a, a rocky desert landscape of stone and sand and so to use the wheel is not particularly practical not particularly efficient um, and so it, it from a practical point of view but sure the Egyptians knew of the wheel um, but not necessarily saw a particular need to utilise it in daily life. Um, and it's interesting that once the Hyksos of Viv introduced the, the chariot it, it, in Egypt, it rapidly becomes a status item, very much like a sports car, <laughs> um, in which the um, elite uh, of, of the, the post-Hyksos so-called New Kingdom, the early 18th dynasty, have chariots built for themselves and they can sort of whiz around and look important of course this requires stones to be moved from certain areas of the desert where they like to parade around specially built race tracks on roadways and it also helps that your chariot was faced with gold leaf <laughs> because if you're whizzing around of speeds extraordinary speeds up to 25 miles an hour in gleaming golden chariots in that hot <laughs> sunny climate you know, you're going to impress everybody around you. And certainly Tutankhamun and, and his father and grandfather and his, certainly his female relatives all had their own personalised golden chariots to sort of turn up at state events and impress everybody they saw. Um, so it was a, it was really comparable to a, a sports car. Um, and and I, I love that aspect about it, the sort of uh, social, religious aspect of the chariot. Uh, th there are also more practical aspects to it. We've got some survivals of some fabulous letters written by members of the Egyptian military when they're stationed up in the Levant after the Hyksos period. There's even one uh, um, uh, member um, of the chariotry division who's talking about taking his chariot for repair into the chariot workshop. So very much like, you know, taking your sports car into the garage for a refit <laughs> because there, there are problems that he can't fix. So it's, it's taking it into the workshop to be mended. And it, I just love that it's, you know, who hasn't been waiting at the garage for, you know, your tyre to be changed or something. Um, and it's, it's, again, bringing the ancient Egyptians back to real life. It's sure you've got your pharaohs whizzing around in golden chariots, but then you've also got the, the soldier waiting for his chariot to be mended. At, at, at the at the workshop so it's it's a, a wonderful kind of culture for this we've got so much evidence for all these facets of of life even when it comes to things like chariots and and their upkeep i, I was i was i mean it's, it's funny that flash rich kids are flash rich kids kind of through the centuries and they want to have fast fast shiny things to run around in on a, on a side different, I was, I was the exhibition at the British Museum recently, the Paris exhibition and the writing exhibition, and they had a divorce document between a husband and wife, and I was really fa I, mean, I was fascinated that 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 as where Egypt had a legal divorce system with settlements and everything like that, and and it kind of played to you know where men and women stood relative to one another. So and in 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 the book in in River God, Titus very proud of the fact that Egyptians are very advanced and and they don't mutilate their women with genital mutilation and they don't cover up their women's faces and that, I mean of course they're second class citizens but still we're very advanced. How how exactly did the two sexes interplay in in in, in ancient Egypt? Well, the the, uh, the situation in ancient Egypt was. Uh one of immense equality. I mean, foreigners, Greeks coming to Egypt, couldn't believe the freedom enjoyed by Egyptian women. They could buy and sell in the market. They could sit on juries. They could leave the marital home, taking with them the possessions that they brought into it. Uh, they could sit on juries. They could practice medicine thousands of years before we were allowed to do so in the modern West. Um, they got equal pay for doing equal jobs, which we still haven't achieved in yes. Britain in 2023. <laughs> um, and there was huge equality. They were not second-class citizens in any way, shape or form. There were up to 15 female pharaohs, not queens. The modern world always used the word queen, which you can achieve by simply marrying a king, let's face it. In Egypt, no. 
at least 15 pharaohs written with the feminine determinative female pharaoh. And, and so it's something that I'm very uh, passionate about. I've done lots of research on because it was a, a unique and wonderful chair. It's underpinned by the fundamental belief in duality in all things, um, day and night, life and death, desert and uh, sort of Nile Valley. Everything had to exist in a state of equilibrium or the universe would fall apart. Male and female, equilibrium. They had over 1,500 deities, but it wasn't a case of the war god was a man, the, the, the deity of, uh, I don't know, lace-making and flower-arranging was female. <laughs> Not at all. The most terrifying deity was Sekhmet, the lioness goddess that, that brings death and destruction when she feels like it, was the protector of Pharaoh, male pharaohs as well as female pharaohs, protected the pharaoh in battle. The iconic gold mask of Tutankhamun, uh, when you look at the brow of that iconic, probably the most iconic object ever made in Egypt, there's a serpent and a vulture. They are the twin goddesses, the heraldic goddesses of Upper and Lower Egypt. They are there to permanently protect the person of pharaoh, uh, to uh, spit venom into the eyes of the enemy. And in a very neat double act, the cobra, of course, kills the enemy. The vulture goddess then comes and clears up the body. It's a wonderfully logical approach, but the, the most uh, aggressive and the mole of the defenders of the, the crown, of the monarchy, and indeed the very gods themselves were female deities, obviously underpinned by the fact that the universe was kept on an even keel uh, by a goddess called Ma, ultimately representing universal truth, cosmic harmony, Everything in the universe was playing nicely by a goddess, not a god. And so the Egyptians fully realised this. Um, obviously, they'd created this belief system in the first place, which worked for them. And if, if one, if either male or female was out of balance, the world simply didn't make sense to them. They also covered their bases by having some deities, which were both the sun god. Everybody says, he this, he that, no. The sun god is called the mother and father of all humankind because the sun god was the first deity to exist and had both male and female elements within itself. It's just the way that the modern West's chosen to use the terminology that makes us think that, oh, the Egyptians uh, you know, were very masculine in the way they did things, but women had some power as well. And it's like, no, mate, it's, it's a balance. And that, for me... You know, could that be a better ancient culture? Indeed, and and, I mean, and the whole way they looked at the, the human body. I mean, that the women didn't have to hide their bodies nearly as much as almost, but certainly, even, ironically, they probably didn't have to hide themselves as much as, as as Egyptians do today. I mean, they're probably freer in terms of their clothing. When it comes to clothing, um, it's a very interesting one because today. Uh, Egyptian men and women tend to be very well covered in traditional garments, long flowing garments which protect them from the sun. In ancient times, this was not necessarily always the case because we see uh, images of men and women wearing precious little. A lot of manual work had to go about their daily routines wearing, you know, a lot of at most. Um, and so you do see a kind of... Uh, a more freer way of, of being. However, it's also the case that we need to look at some of it in a very uh, careful way because, for instance, in art, it's vital that if you're portraying someone, a, a human figure, you had to see all the key elements of that figure because in the next world, if anything happened to the physical body, the soul could then inhabit those images on the wall scenes, for instance. And so... When you're shown in profile, you have the nose shown because that's how it's best seen and how it could best function in the, the, the next world. But the eye, the eye is not shown in profile. The eye is shown from, you know, uh, as, a, as an actual eye so the deceased could see through the eye. And that's why breasts are often shown in artwork. Women are often shown uh, bare-breasted because then in the next world, the breast can f perform, they can, you know, feed the offspring and so forth. So it's not necessarily a snapshot as we would understand it. It's kind of 
coded language within the art forms. But for sure, from a, a ritualistic point of view and from a social point of view, we know that life in ancient Egypt was very different. For instance, at Karnak Temple, where we think that it was really just a lot of male priests shuffling about in white robes. Not exactly, because parts of Karnak, uh, there were special buildings called porches of drunkenness. And the whole idea there was that you would gather on specific times, you would become completely inebriated to better contact the gods. Uh, certainly the goddesses, such as Sekhmet, the aforementioned lioness goddess, and her karma alter ego, goddess Hathor, goddess of beauty, both of them are the ladies of drunkenness. Ladies of And to show your, your devotion, the more you drank, the better it was. You could commune so clearly with the goddesses if you were as drunk as them. And all sorts of things happened in these porches of drunkenness between men and women because Hathor, the goddess of sexual love, um, so, you know, bring it on. You know, they had they had a high old time at Karnak and elsewhere in Egypt. Um, various temples where all sorts of behaviours going on and fantastic accounts of the, the pilgrims, male and female, pulling up at the side of the river on these boats, a little bit like hen parties on court. <laughs> Uh, there's there's one great account in Herodotus. These women on boats sailing uh, sort of north uh, down the Nile to places of pilgrimage, and whenever they pass a village, they, they sail close to the river and hold up their dresses and flash the people. And it's sort of <laughs> it's just like on the back of the coach, you know, when you get usually men doing similar things and mooning at the car behind. But I love that vivacity. I mean, it's quite crude in some ways, but I love the the fact that they really went for it, you know, they show how devoted they are to their deities and having a good time. Just one final question on that line: Did 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 would Pharaoh, for example, or indeed any powerful lord, was there was there an equivalent to the later kind of Ottoman harem? I mean, or, or were women were there, I mean, were there female only spaces within within palaces, homes, whatever, or was the whole thing open to both sexes? They seem certainly, in, in the case of male pharaohs, like my favourite pharaoh, Amenhotep III, who was Tutankhamun's grandfather, he's quite notorious because he had a great royal wife called Queen Ty, who was absolutely brilliant, very forceful in her character, very strong in her imagery. And yet he also had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mimers, diplomatic gifts from across the empire, all the places where Egypt... Uh, had uh, vassal kingdoms and controlled these areas and what could gladden Pharaoh's heart more than um, a, a set of new wives who brought their entourages with them uh, and they all moved into this vast palace that Amenhotep had on the West Bank at Thebes so that must have been a, a real right of noise um, all these women producing all these children Pharaoh, the, the, the big male figure at the heart of all this surrounded by his hundreds of wives and all their attendants. And so male pharaohs certainly did have lots of, I mean, the old text called concubines, which is a hideous term. They were minor wives, you know, the terminology tells us. Minor wives plus major wives, great royal wives, usually one, sometimes two. Um, the setup for the, the, the female pharaohs is something I'm currently researching. Because I'd love to know background was there, you know. Did Hatshepsut really have a, you know, a room full of uh, dashing young men? I'd like to think so. We certainly know that uh, there are rumours that she was sort to of her senior male advisor Senmut. Um, but there's so much we've still to explore about ancient Egypt. This is just one part. I find utterly riveting. It's fantastic. And were there, were there, but there was no physical separation then between the between the female members of the court and the male members? There doesn't seem to be. I mean, you do see in banquet scenes, the women sitting together, the men sitting together, and then groups, men and women sitting together also. So it's like a modern wedding party where you do see women congregating, you know, having a bit of a chat, the men having a drink at the bar, although in ancient Egypt, to probably be the women having the drink at the bar. Um, and but they did mix. We do see this throughout society. We see men and women side by side in the marketplace working. We see them 
uh, plowing and uh, reaping in the fields, working together mm -hmm. there. We see them producing uh, goods and commodities side by side. Um, so this idea of segregation doesn't really work that well when it's sort of thrown back into ancient Egypt, even though the art sometimes shows these groupings. It also sh shows men and women together very clearly. Um, and so, as, I, as I've also mentioned, men and women receiving the same pay for doing the same jobs in the same workplace. Uh, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting one, just to look at the, the evidence for how these people did live side by side, work side by side, and clearly achieve so much by working together. Oh, wonderful. Tom, maybe you better have a, a word in there to open that. Yeah, I would just come back to something you said. I think you said about Ra, that he's described as a god and a he, but actually includes both. Was it Ra that you said that about? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the sun god in general. I mean, obviously, Ra is just the, the name of the sun god um, uh, uh, in certain contexts. Yeah, yeah. The, the sun itself was worshipped under a number of names. Right. But the text do tell us in the New Kingdom, the 18th dynasty, just slightly after um, the Hyksos period, there are hymns to the sun god, the mother and father of all mankind. And the most ancient texts about the creation of the world tell us the sun rose uh, on the first day um, rose out of a giant lotus flower from the waters of creation and the sun went on to produce a male child and a female child, uh, these two deities from whom more deities were, were formed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this epithet, mother and father of all humankind, it's sort of this, this understanding that you can't just have, you know, uh, male this, male that, male the other, you know, it, it has to integrate both. Yeah. So obviously we're looking over thousands of years of Egyptian culture yeah. in different parts of Egypt where there were nuances within all this. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's the kind of take on, the ancient Egyptian take on who and what the sun god actually was. Yeah. Because I think um, I saw in your book that, um, well, Wilbur's novel is called River God, but I think what I took from, from your book is that actually it could equally have been called river goddess because I think Happy, the, the Nile deity, is, uh, I think you describe him, stroke her, as uh, androgynous or maybe gender fluid would be a good term. But um, can you tell us a bit about Happy? Because obviously that's, the t in a sense, the title character of the novel. Yeah, Happy was a fascinating deity, uh, obviously, because the Nile brings fertility to Egypt. You can't just have, you know, Isle or just female, because fertility just isn't possible until you've got the two combined. But the idea of gender fluidity is fascinating. You, you all goddesses like Sekhmet and Moot and various others shown with a phallus. They're, they're quite clearly female, but they're shown with a phallus. They're shown... Again, a gender fluidity, which is sort of very much a hot topic at the moment, but the Egyptians had no problem understanding that. And they didn't like to compartmentalise either deities or, or humans in the way we are obsessed with doing today. Today in our society, what are you? What little box, what little compartment do you fit into? The Egyptians wouldn't really have got that. It's sort of wasn't really in their mindset and so there's a fluidity in their society not just in terms of male female but in terms of Egyptian or non-Egyptian uh, you know with with the Hyksos the pre-Hyksos period with people coming into Egypt from outside and as long as they you know live by a, a general you know set of, of rules and laws um which didn't really tip over into religion, for instance, then that was fine. If you paid the taxes, respected the land you were living in, happy days, fine, you know. And I think it's that level of tolerance that we in the modern West have lost to our cost today that the Egyptians understood. And that's why they lasted far longer than any other comparable culture, because they were able to understand the world around them and, and and those within it. It's nice to think that Pharaoh would not have endlessly been bothered by people asking, oh, so is it, can a goddess really have a penis? Which would be a <laughs> <laughs> today, so. 
Well, it also brings you on to this idea that you, you've got sort of, um, again, it, it, when it comes down to the modern world, this idea of, oh, men wearing makeup, that's weird, oh, men in a dress. I mean, try telling, you know, the mighty Kotov Moses III who expanded Egypt's borders as far as the river Euphrates on the, the border with modern Turkey and way down deep into the Sudan, when he's preparing his troops for battle, winning battle after battle, essential that they were all wearing the right perfume, essential they all had their eyeliner on and <laughs> stuff. It's sort of, it's, it doesn't compute into the modern world. You know, but it was essential. If you weren't decked out in the, the correct way, then, you know, things weren't quite right. And so the reward for bravery in battle, you got a lovely big sort of uh, blob of perfume um, to enjoy, you know, this wonderful, rich Egyptian fragrance as a mark that you were anointed and that you'd shared in this, this great event, whether it was militarily or a, a, a cultural or social event. So, again, for me, that's one of the, the great images from Egypt. On one of the tomb scenes at a, a site called Deir el-Medina, the work, so-called Workers' Village, so our ancient Thebes, there's this scene of, of busy people going about their daily business, and there's a little vignette of, a, of some workers, some builders, and they're all, they've all got the hammer and nails and chisels and heaven knows what. And one of the guys, he's got a little chest, inside which he has the eyeliner, the black eye paint. And his job was to go around the workers and put the black eye paint because the eye paint in Egypt was like sunglasses. It reduced the glare of the sun. They mixed it with medicinal ingredients to keep the eyes free of disease. We know from our own scientific analysis we do here in our lab at home, um, these eye paints, these coals contained within them um, various medicinal ingredients that kept the eyes in good condition but that idea cannot be projected 3,000 years into the future walking past a modern building site where you've got the guys you know the brickies and they're all there with the little compacts and they're just putting the mascara on wouldn't but in Egypt of course you know it's funny you should say that because American footballers who are very huge massive men often put black paint just on the top of their cheekbones Precisely for the same is because um, it stops the it stops the reflections of their eyes. Yeah, the lights reflecting from the pitch exactly, and that's something I, I I often draw an analogy with the fact that they've got these big lines here, just like the Egyptian eye paint. So when you look at Tut's mask, and you you don't think, oh, that's a, a young guy in lots of makeup, but when you look, he's got exactly that extending right to his yes, ears. Yes. These huge big lines, these cosmetic lines. And we're so used to seeing it, we don't. We see it, but we don't see it, if you know what I mean. But it's exactly the same thing. These things are, are sort of, they look so aesthetic and beautiful, and yet many of them have their roots in very practical things, you know, to reduce the light going into the eye. Uh, and, of course, Wilbur kind of catches um, this kind of uh, fluidity between the sexes, I think, brilliantly, by, by having the protagonist and the narrator of the book be this, this eunuch, Taita, who sort of exists in the space between the sexes. Um, and it, it, I think listening to you, what I'm getting is that actually, he, he, in a sense, he couldn't have chosen a, a better character um, to kind of em embody all these um, kind of fluid dualities uh, within Egypt. Um, I mean, I'm curious about eunuchs, because I guess I think of them much more in terms of things like the Ottoman Empire, um, where they, they rise to these great positions of power, or the Byzantine Empire. Um, do we know, I mean, I don't know if we can know, do we know anything about specifically eunuchs in ancient Egypt? It is a very difficult area to try and find out exactly what was going on in ancient times. Um, I'm doing some research at the moment, some research for a, a TV project, and we're trying to find out, is there any evidence for this? Um, and it's it's sort of pretty tricky to try, because obviously there are physical remains, mummified remains, uh, but the problem there is also that that physical part of the body, you know, the sort of male genitalia, when you start... It sounds rather unsavoury. It's not that we spend our time, you know, researching just this, but quite often these these things are missing. For instance, Tutankhamun's 
mummified body, um, the penis disappeared. But that's since, obviously, the discovery in 1922, when it was clearly there, at some point between 1922 and today, it went missing. Was it taken as as this bizarre souvenir by, by someone? Certainly at some point, probably in the 1940s, um, and, and things taken from the body, including this important physical attribute. Um, likewise... Um, some of the uh, 19th dynasty pharaohs who were famous for having numerous children, numerous offspring, and yet again, the physical equipment required is no longer there. So an interesting one. It's, uh, shall we call it a grey area? <laughs> well, uh, before we disappear too deeply into any more of these uh, grey areas, uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time in this episode. But the good news is that Joanne has agreed to join us again next time and we'll be delving further into life in ancient Egypt and the world of River God. So until then, it's goodbye from me, Diana Thomas. And it's goodbye from me, Tom Harper. Smith's show is produced by Christopher Wynn. Music by Dewey DeLay.